moving to the last lesson of chapter one in our book. So we've made some really good progress. And this lesson is called, A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words. And basically what we're trying to do is, we're gonna have word problems in geometry. And we need to basically learn to look at these word problems, figure out what is this question asking us, and by drawing pictures and diagrams and things like that, we can kind of, you know, learn how to solve this information by using the picture to help us. A lot of times we can't just mentally imagine all this. We need to look at something specific. And so developing our visual thinking skills will help us to solve the problems once we have translated them into drawings. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of word problem examples. There's gonna be a lot of pausing that you'll need to do in order to solve some of these things, so be prepared for that. All right, our first example says volumes one and two of a two volume set of math books sit next to each other on a shelf. They sit in their proper order. Volume one is on the left and volume two is on the right. Each front and back cover is one eighth inch thick and the pages portion of each book is one inch thick. If a bookworm starts at the first page of volume one and burrows all the way through to the last page of volume two, how far will it travel? Now I want you to pause this, draw a picture to help you visualize what's going on with this word problem, read through it a couple of times, and answer the question. It's probably going to take you a few minutes to do that at least. I'd say at least four or five minutes. So pause it as long as necessary. And when you're ready, let's go ahead and hit play and come back to the question. All right, so I'm hoping you actually did pause it to uh, go through this process. So what we'd have to do is, we have two textbooks or two math books and they're sitting side by side. So let's draw, and again, my pictures aren't always the best, but we wanna make them as much as we can, but they don't have to be perfect. They have to just work for us. So make it work for you. Let's try and erase some of this little bit. Oops, that was a big circle to erase. All right, so I have my two books side by side, lovely renditions here, and it told us that these were in order, so the one on the left is volume one, and the one on the right is volume two. Now, chances are, if you solve this question, all right, you got two and one-fourth inches that the bookworm traveled, eating through, burrowing his way through the textbooks. Seems pretty reasonable. You know, each of these segments right here are one eighth inch, and then you have an inch of pages on the inside. So if they're starting on the first page here, going all the way through, getting to the covers, and then going all the way through, that seems like it'd be two and a fourth inches. But, unfortunately, that is not the correct answer. Let's think about why. Now, if I have books side by side on the bookshelf, and I pull out the book, let's say I'm pulling out volume two, all right? So I pull it out with my left hand, if I pull it out with my left hand using just my finger and my thumb, my thumb is going to be on the first page of the book, all right? So this right here, this little dot right there is the first page of the second volume. So what that tells us is then that here is the first page of volume one, and here is the last page of volume two. Because when you have books side by side, the start of the book is on the right hand side. It's only when you pull it out and open it that now it falls in order as we go reading left to right. So, technically, we, this worm started on the first page and was burrowing all the way to the last page of volume two. It only had to go through the covers. So one eighth inch of the first cover and one eighth inch of the second cover, that gives us two eighths inches, which is one fourth of an inch. So the bookworm only traveled one fourth of an inch by going through the book. Again, drawing a picture and visualizing what happens with our books is really important for that. All right. So hopefully you understood that. If not, we can definitely talk about it more in class. Let's take a look at the second example. Or let's not. Okay. Now this one's tricky, so I'm actually going to go through the whole process and probably will not do 
nearly as good of a job drawing it as I can. When we have, okay, so Harold and Dina, let's read the word follow. Harold, Dina, and Linda are standing on a flat, dry field reading their treasure map. Harold is standing at one of the features marked on the map, a gnarled tree stump, and Dina is standing atop a large black boulder. The map shows that the treasure is buried 60 meters from the tree stump and 40 meters from the large black boulder. Harold and Dina are standing 80 meters apart. Where is the locus of points where the treasure might be buried? All right, the first thing you want to do is consider, first off, where are Harold and Dina? So let's say that Harold is hanging out over here on the tree stump. We'll say T for tree stump. And Dina is hanging out over here on the right-hand side on the boulder. So B for boulder. And we know that the distance, Harold and Dina are 80 meters apart. So from here to here, that's 80 meters. Now, it tells us that the treasure, according to the map, the treasure is 60 meters from the tree stump and 40 meters from the large black boulder. So, immediately, some of you might be thinking, okay, well then that means that the treasure could be somewhere here, right? If we say that this is 60 meters and this is 40 meters, that's where the treasure is. That is certainly a possibility, but we have to imagine that there's another possibility. And so one way we have of figuring that out, and this is where my lack of drawing skills is going to not be in our favor, is let's imagine that the distance from the tree stump to the treasure, all right, let's call this treasure. Can't say T, because we already have T for the tree stump. All right, the distance from the T, uh, the tree stump to the treasure, is 60 meters. Well, that could be represented by a circle. So again, ideally, the distance all the way around the circle should be the same. It's not quite the same. And the radius of that circle is 60 meters. On the other hand, we're also going to have a similar scenario with our boulder. The distance from the boulder to the treasure is 40 meters. Well, that could represent a radius of another circle that from the boulder, 40 meters around is the treasure. So Dina could turn around in a circle and 40 meters from any point that she's looking at would be the circle, would be the treasure. So let's say then where the two circles meet, all right, that's 40 meters. That's 60 meters. So notice that we have two points of intersection of these two circles. Those are going to represent the possibility, the locus of points, where the treasure might be buried. So we have a 50-50 chance of getting it correct. So not too bad. But using triangulation to figure out the points of that third point, that gives us one of the points. But we also have to consider flipping that triangle to the other side to get the other point. And using circles helps us do that. That's really the only thing the question is asking for where are the two points at. So looking at the treasure map, we could find it. I'd say their odds are pretty good. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to the last slide of chapter one. The last slide of chapter one wants us to take a look at classifying quadrilaterals. And one way of helping us classify quadrilaterals is to use a Venn diagram. Venn diagram shows us things that are in common and not in common with various objects. So let's say that the whole box represents quadrilaterals. Alright, so these are all the shapes that are four sides. So in our family of quadrilaterals, we have three main categories. We have trapezoids. Alright. Four-sided shapes where opposite side, one set of opposite sides are parallel. We have kites. Oops, if you spell it correctly. All right, kites are where you have two sets of congruent sides where the top adjacent sides are congruent to each other and the bottom adjacent sides are congruent to each other. All right, nothing parallel there. And then we have parallelograms. Parallelograms where opposite sides are parallel and congruent. But within parallelograms, we still have some 
categories that help us. Right? I have parallelograms where all four sides are the same side. They're all congruent. We call those rhombuses. All right? I also have parallelograms where all four angles are the same angle. Where all four angles are congruent, which means they're all right angles, so these are rectangles. And then the most specific parallelogram category I have is a square. All right, a square has the characteristics of a rhombus, all four sides are congruent, has the char characteristic of a rectangle, where all four angles are congruent, and opposite sides are parallel, and it's four sides. So a square is a rhombus, it's a rectangle, it's a parallelogram, and it's a quadrilateral. So the Venn diagram helps me show all of these categories in order of our quadrilaterals. So knowing those specific categories when I'm reading word problems, it can help me visualize what's happening a little bit more easily. And that's the end. That's discovering geometry. Uh, from here on out, things just get a little bit more concrete, more examples, more details, and we go on from there.